Oh, I think we're live, guys. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode. We got a repeat guest this time. Is Jimmy Song. You guys know who he is. He's an entrepreneur, Bitcoin programmer, and uh, one of the most, let's say, prolific writers in the in the in the in the, in the space. Because I don't know if you sleep, bro. I don't know. <laughs> I, I sleep. I sleep. Not very much, but I still sleep. You still sleep. That's good to hear. So it's been uh, quite a. I don't know how best way I can say this, but. Uh, interesting roller coaster ride in the past month or so you know you had bitcoin cash this whole bitcoin bull thing and all these different camps are arguing you got all these miners doing different things but why don't you kind of give us your own perspective in the last couple of weeks of uh, what happened well uh 2x was uh was scheduled to come on um at a particular block it was uh, supposed to be about 90 days after segwit activated it um as per the new york agreement uh, a New York agreement was something that, you know, the CEOs of various companies decided, hey, we're going to figure out a way around this whole scaling block, uh, you know, lockdown or whatever. And and uh, and they, they just said, hey, we're going to do both SegWit and larger blocks. And we're going to do that, um, you know, in this particular way. Uh, the SegWit part went through fine um, and SegWit is now on the network. But uh, when the 2X part came, um, you know, there was a lot of resistance. There was a lot of people. There were a lot of people that wanted, that were thinking, "Hey, this this doesn't make any sense." And uh, and there was even a futures market on Bitfinex and a few other places, and they indicated, okay, um, at least the people that had the money did not like this fork. And about uh, ten days ago, I think maybe twelve days ago, something like that. Um, Mike Belshi, Jihan Wu, uh, Peter Smith, uh, Eric Voorhees, and a bunch of other people, they, they just sort of canceled the fork. And that was seen as sort of like, oh, okay, I guess, I guess they're not going to do it. Um, uh, the story later on, according to Jeff Garzik and the BTC1 Slack, is uh, there were, they had miners lined up to mine the 2x hard fork, but it turned out that uh, they wouldn't mine it for very long. <laughs> they would only mi agree to mine for about 12 hours and then and then they wouldn't mine anymore, uh, which which would obviously depress the 2X price and everything else. Uh, but yeah, that, that's kind of what happened. I, ha I, I have an article from earlier today that went through sort of the bugs that people found in the 2X hard fork software um and it's it, it turned out like had they gone through with it it would have been a disaster so um yeah i saw that jeff garzik was tweeting something about that as well yeah yeah so basically there was an off by one error that which forced the hard fork to happen a block early and there was another error that caused the mining software to not actually create the large block needed to fork it and yeah. So, uh, yeah, there are there are a few problems probably due to the lack of review and testing on that on that uh, on that for that software. But yeah, it, that's basically what's happened, and here we are. <laughs> so, what's happening right now with because uh, the biggest dilemma in the space, what I think is people are getting confused, or people are getting mm -hmm. angry as well. So, the, a there's people getting confused, newcomers that have no idea. You have Bitcoin Gold, mm -hmm. Bitcoin uh, Classic, Bitcoin, uh, you know, Cash. And mm -hmm. then from the angle of um, the mempool attacks. So can you kind mm -hmm. of touch base on that? What was happening with that? Well, speculatory, like they speculate mm -hmm. that's what happened, right? Yeah, so um, so Bitcoin Cash had sort of a massive pump, not this past weekend, but the weekend before. So that would be about like nine, 10 days ago. It, it, it went from something like 0.1 Bitcoin all the way up to something like 0.5 Bitcoin. So it was a massive pump, it went up five times its price, up 400%. Um, and that that changed the mining incentives significantly. So, uh, you know, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin use the same uh, mining equipment. It's the same proof of work algorithm. So a lot of miners went over to Bitcoin Cash. And on top of that, uh, you know, like a lot of mining equipment seems to have gone offline at some point, like 30% of the mining hash power just sort of disappeared. No one knows what happened to it. There's some speculation that it's being shipped from China to somewhere else or whatever. But a lot of mining equipment sort of disappeared. You had Bitcoin Cash going up. So a lot of Bitcoin miners went over to Bitcoin Cash and they were mining that. So blocks were slow. Um, and, you know, there's some speculation that on top of that, there were all these like um, transactions that were sent into the mempool to spam it. Um, so that that caused sort of like historically high fees on Bitcoin. 
So how would they spam it? So basically they'll do transactions while putting almost zero fees to to finish the transaction. Well, so they, they could put zero fee transactions, but almost like nobody accepts those and they're they're not even like considered really. But they, they could put very low fee transactions in there, even some higher fee ones. And you know, the idea being uh, if you're a miner and you put a lot of spam transactions in, everyone who wants to get into a block will um, pay more than whatever your transactions are. So, mm -hmm. and if you mine your own transaction with your own fee, then you're you're actually like breaking even on that. You you just have to waste a little bit of block space. So they don't really mine that much, um, and it caused like historically high prices. It was going to like a thousand satoshi per byte, which is I mean, like hundreds of dollars on a normal transaction. So, uh, so you know, there there were some really high fees. At one point, there was a block that had more uh, reward and fees than the mining reward. So, mining reward is twelve and a half bitcoins per block. There was one block that had like thirteen bitcoin in fees. So that miner made out like a bandit, obviously. Like they they, <laughs> they got a lot of, of fees out of it. But uh, but yeah, I, it, like it was due to Bitcoin Cash being you know high price. Some mining uh, equipment seems to be ha have taken off, uh, been taken out. But I mean everything sort of equalized because uh, Bitcoin Cash had their hard fork, which changed their difficulty adjustment algorithm. So it's a, it's more in tune, and it wasn't like enormously profitable to uh, uh, to mine Bitcoin Cash instead of Bitcoin. And you know, uh, basically, it equalized. And this past weekend, it was you could you could get in transactions for like fifty cents, no problem. Yeah. And what's happening right now with this whole Bitcoin Gold? Like, what is that? Yeah. So Bitcoin Gold was a hard fork, and the one innovation that Bitcoin Gold had, uh, well, so it's a hard fork of Bitcoin. It's basically utilizing the entire Bitcoin blockchain up to a certain block, which they froze on like. October 23rd or something like that and uh, and basically they they just um, uh, they they changed the proof of work to something called Equihash which is something that Zcash uses and uh, they they changed uh, a few other parameters uh, but basically it's more or less like Bitcoin except uh, it's it's supposed to tax minor centralization um, but the th the main innovation in Bitcoin Gold is not necessarily the proof of work change that's been done before, but they did a mid blockchain pre mine. So they took they after they froze the block, they they mined eight thousand blocks only by themselves. So mm. eight thousand times twelve and a half block reward that that turns out to be a hundred thousand Bitcoin Gold coins that they that they kept entirely to themselves to fund further development and so on. And they released a blockchain, I guess, like last week sometime. And and what's been happening is, uh, you know, there are there aren't that there was one wallet that was like mal had malware in it, so some people lost money. But basically, um, if you had Bitcoin be before October twenty third, you you have the equivalent amount of Bitcoin Gold, which is worth around one hundred twenty dollars, I believe per Bitcoin gold, but not that many places trade it though, you know, like I, I imagine more will just because it's easier to list a coin. It's about as easy to list the coin on an exchange than to like pay out people, which you need to do as, uh, you know, um, somebody that's taken possession and, you know, you, you need to give everybody their coins because of fiduciary duty. And does Bitcoin gold have replay protection? Yeah, it has a uh, strong replay protection, so you don't need to worry too much. Um, this is why only a few wallets support it. Two um, X originally wasn't supposed, or they their plan was not offering replay protection. That way, every wallet could be compatible with it. But it also confuses it because you don't know which blockchain to re uh, listen to. So, there, uh, you know, I, I yeah, it, it turns out that uh, pretty much every fork going forward will probably have some some form of strong replay protection, which means that your Bitcoin gold transaction is not valid on Bitcoin, and your Bitcoin transaction is not valid on Bitcoin gold. So moving on, you just wrote that piece for Keynesian and Austrian economics. You want to kind of dive into that, your like take on it? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, if you think about Bitcoin uh, 2x and Bitcoin cash to some degree as well, um, and, you know, Roger Ver and Jihan Wu and all of these businesses that signed the New York agreement, 
they kind of want a lot of transactions to happen, right? They make their mm -hmm. money when there are, you know, deposits to their exchange, when people are transacting, when people are buying stuff or, you know, um, you know, withdrawing Bitcoins or whatever. That's how they make their money. And, uh, and when, when you have a one megabyte block size limit, that limits the throughput, the, the velocity of money, as an economist would say. And, uh, and, and that was kind of a problem for them. They didn't like that. And it, it imposes higher and higher costs. And if you look at the Bitcoin blockchain, um, you know, most of the transactions are actually coming from these businesses, right? Like Coinbase has a ton of uh, transactions. Blockchain has a ton of transactions. Zappo has a ton of transactions. I mean, I, I've, uh, I, I've heard that Zappo, for example, will oftentimes take up like 20 or 30 percent of every block. Wow. Because, you know, they they, they do that um, blockchain that info. I've been told at times they they fill up 50 to 70 percent. I mean, it, it depends on what time of day or whatever. Um, and, you know, when, when their customers utilize it. But, you know, these businesses take up most of these blocks. So for them, the blockchain uh, is a public resource, but they they really need it to. They're, they're sort of arguing for wider roads at the cost of everybody else. Um, and that and that's sort of a Keynesian sort of view. Um, that's that's the velocity of money, sort of wanting everyone to consume more and more, so they would have uh, more of uh, you know they they would get more business essentially. And and if you think about it, this is kind of how our you know our government and big business when they like combine and like set policy this is usually the policy that they come up with is okay let's just get people to consume more and more and you know like you know regulations are around okay well you can't use that baby seed anymore because it's only good for seven years you know like you you have to go and buy a new one you know like it's it's all based on consumption and that that's the sort of policies that you tend up having to make um bitcoin is unique because you had some holders that actually fought back and that's that that's those were the people that wanted to keep the one megabyte size limit and they were more concerned with security um changing it from one megabyte to two megabytes um might sound good in theory but there there are lots of security trade-offs um specifically if you went with the 2x hard fork you would have a different development team you would have a development team led by jeff garzik and uh, and as i pointed out in t uh, today's article, you know, there are bugs in that software. And uh, those bugs could potentially mean that you lose money. And security is extremely important if you're a holder, right? Like that's that's why you're use using it. So you have, you're using it as a store of value. So security is paramount over everything. Medium of exchange matters because you do need to eventually cash out, but it's like number 15 or 16 on the list. There's a lot of other things that are much more important to you, like, durability, fungibility, security, and all these other things. Um, so it was, and I would put that as sort of like the Austrian view, and I, I labeled those two uh, two camps as crypto Keynesians versus crypto Austrians. Uh, one is much more concerned with consumption and and sort of velocity of money. The other is more concerned with savings and make sure making sure that everything is secure. So moving forward, based on all this craziness that we've been through in the last month or two, What's your predict predictions for the future? Well, uh, yeah, I, great question. The first thing I would say is there are going to be a lot more hard forks. Um, there, there's already talk of something called Bitcoin Silver. Mm. Um, that's, uh, you know, there's not that much detail, but somebody announced that it's probably going to happen and it's probably going to be worth something. So people are uh, just coming out trying to make free money pretty much. Yeah, pretty. I mean, it's not not unlike ICOs at the beginning of this year, right? Like, uh, you know, there, there was so much momentum around those. People were just like, Making obviously Ponzi-like ICOs, and they got mm -hmm. away with it. Um, and and this is going to happen with uh, with hard forks. You have Bitcoin Silver. You have something called Bitcoin 2M, which is supposed to be kind of like 2X, except they're going to change proof of work, add strong replay protection, add a few other things, um, maybe even change block. I think Bitcoin Silver is the one that changes the block times, right? Like to something like one minute instead of ten minutes. There's something mm -hmm. else called Bitcoin Cash Plus. Which, which is hilarious, but that's going to be on January 2nd, something like that. Uh, yeah, and you know, that, that's just the ones I know about. I'm sure there are more that are in store. And the thing is, like, they can, 
like all coins were really popular around 2013, 2014. There were, there were a lot of them being launched. They're kind of like ICOs were earlier this year. And Bitcoin hard forks are going to be the new, new thing come, going forward. And the reason why people do them is because it looks like free money, right? Yes. Like you create this and it's greed on both sides, right? It's greed for the people that are creating it because they like Bitcoin, the Bitcoin gold guys, you can like sort of do a mid block pre mine for ICOs. It's, you know, I get to create money out of thin air uh, for all coins. I get to create money out of thin air. Um, and for buyers, uh, it looks like, hey, um, OK, I get I get this stuff for free and it's going to go up and, you know, I get to make all this money. Uh, so you know, those, those tend to be a bubble. Uh, I mean, all coins stop. I mean, there's still all coins being launched, but it's nowhere near like in its heyday where you were, you know, there were like five or 10 coins launching like every day, kind of mm -hmm. like the heyday of ICOs um, was maybe a couple months ago. It, it feels like it's on its downslope already, Thank but God. you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There were like five ICOs launching every day. Well, that that point has yet to be hit for hard forks, and you know there there are going to be a lot of hard forks coming, and it's uh, it's. But it also seems to me with these hard forks, they're mm -hmm. quite dependent. Like for example, people who keep uh, their crypto mm -hmm. on Ledger or Trezor or whatever mm -hmm. or wallets, they're hinged on these wallet companies to actually provide them the accessibility. Mm -hmm. Then. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and part of the problem is that you can totally externalize the costs of of development to everybody else, right? It's, it's these wallet developers that are kind of suffering and paying the negative externalities. Uh, and, and, you know, the, this is part of the attractiveness of a hard fork is that you don't have to do all the work yourself. Mm. Other people are going to be forced to do it. And because exchanges have a fiduciary duty to provide these coins to their users, well, you know, they're, they're going to have to support it in some, to some degree. And so they can hack the fiduciary duty to get at least some attention from exchanges because they're forced to, and because you know they have they already have a fair distribution. This is an enormous problem for pretty much every altcoin and ICO out there. Is how do you get fair distribution? And there have been like like really unfair distributions all throughout the life of all of these coins. I mean, like you look at something like Ripple, they just created them all. And then just sort of started doling them out. And there's still like a huge reserve of ripples that exist that haven't been released to the public. Um, and, you know, there, there have been other uh, mechanisms like airdrops, you know, um, I mean, Byteball is obviously doing something similar like that. But this is essentially an airdrop to all Bitcoin holders. And uh, and that that's how people are kind of looking at it. But. Yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a negative externality that everyone has to pay, uh, and it's mostly developers that end up having to pay. So it looks like free money, but really, it's it's it's, it's a dilution. Actually, uh, it's a dilution of everything. Well, I mean, it's it's developer time that that's 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 causing all. Of, it, it's the monetization of developer time. Like all of these things, altcoins, ICOs, uh, hard forks, everything. It's monetization of developer time, and it's it's sort of like the future expectation that these developers will continue developing on it that the price reflects, and uh, it, it it's it's a bit unfortunate that that's uh, you know externalized to Bitcoin developers, but that's uh, you know until we find a good solution to this problem and. You know, we have exchanges so me, that are decentralized. Let yeah. me propose you yeah. this. So, since we're seeing uh -huh. this in the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem right now, mm -hmm. can we also say this a probability in the Ethereum ecosystem or Litecoin ecosystem in the future? Yeah, possibly. I mean, you can do uh, the analogy I would make is this: you can do ICOs on Ethereum Classic, but not many people do. Mm -hmm. You can do ICOs on EOS, not many people do. You can do ICOs on Neo and all these other ones. Like, they, it, it's possible to do them. But most people choose Ethereum. Why? Well, because that's the platform everyone else has done ICOs, and it's yep. it's seen as less risky. So you could do it. Uh, you could hard fork Ethereum. You could hard fork, you know, Ripple. You could hard fork whatever. But you're probably not going to as a hard forker because you're going to make the most money as a greedy hard fork creator by hard forking Bitcoin. So that's that's probably what's going to happen. Interesting. Well, it's always a pleasure, Jimmy. I love having you on and hearing your insights. Um, I know you've been having your workshops for Bitcoin coders. Is that still going on? Mm -hmm.
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so programmingblockchain.com, that's the website that I have set up for it. Um, thank you, Amir, by the way. Amir has been sort of my marketing strategist for, for the website. But basically, uh, I've, uh, I, I've uh, been teaching normal developers to become Bitcoin developers. And, uh, and you know, it's a two-day in-person live seminar. And uh, I, I fire hose you with information. I've been told that, and, and actually know that it's at least a semester's worth of like uh, in information days. in two days. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, you know you you code your own Bitcoin library, and you know you you have to you know uh, at, in the middle of the second day, sort of a highlight is you you have to create a testnet transaction from scratch using your own library. And uh, and when when students you know like finally send their test that transaction they're like yes I finally get it you know this is what's happening uh, but yeah I, I have more of them coming up I have the Austin one December sixth and seventh I have a Charlotte one January twenty second twenty no sixteenth uh, seventeenth London January twenty second twenty third Amsterdam January twenty sixth twenty seventh but yeah there's there's four of them there there will probably be more if you're interested in sort of uh, having it in other places, please contact me. My email is at the at the bottom of programmingblockchain.com. So um, yeah, you know, send me a proposal and uh, and we'll, we'll see what can happen. Beautiful, Jimmy, always a pleasure. Guys, go check out the workshop and I'll see you guys soon. Cheers. Bye.